Welcome to the Love Fly podcast. Paul is our fear of flying coach. And today we welcome back Captain Steve. Welcome back, Steve. How are you doing, sir? Very good, very good. Yes, uh, so Steve, thank you very much for agreeing to come on this because, as you know, Steve is on quite a lot of the podcasts because he works with us at Love Fly. He helps run, he's on the 30-day programme, he's on the live recording, he's even in the on the live webinar at the end of June, depending on when this goes out. Steve, I just thought it'd be interesting because we've <clears throat> talked quite a lot around different things and a question that's been in my mind and I asked this again to a, d- a different captain the other day. It's okay, not being replaced. Uh, oh. I asked this to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been very insecure then. <laughs> no, not at all. No. I, so I, a question that I think I, I like asking pilots is why aren't you scared? Oh, good question, Paul. Yes, why aren't we scared? I guess the bottom line to answer that in a, in a really uh, sort of one sentence is that phrase, knowledge is, is power. And because we understand exactly how the theory of flight works and how aeroplanes work and how they're made and what the backup systems, et cetera, that, that, that's, that's why we, we, I guess we, we trust in our tools. Great. Well, so, thanks ever so much for the podcast. That was brilliant. Uh, <laughs> really helpful. So <laughs> tell us a bit more about that. <laughs> because the thing that I thought was that one of the, programs that nervous flyers run is the sort of catastrophizing the what if what if what if you know imagining the worst case scenario type thing Mm -hmm. and you go into simulators and you've watched footage and listened to black box recordings and you've you've literally been involved with all of those worst case scenarios obviously historically now Mm -hmm. um how do you manage that when you think you've got all that responsibility of having all those people on your aircraft i mean it's just yeah i mean you you fly you're on the 787 Mm. which holds how many now 264 yeah so how do you how do you manage that so you've got all of this wrestling you know that responsibility and all this kind of stuff you've seen and thought about Mm. actually uh it's actually quite easy to uh, manage 264 people or, or if you're on bigger aeroplanes, you know, the more people you carry because you're looking after number one. So if you look after yourself, then everyone's coming with you and and we all do. And I think I've said to you on previous podcasts that um, my favourite destination is home and life is just completely wonderful. And uh, I wouldn't jeopardise that for anything. So doing this job as a career is um, is you know, not only rewarding, but uh, I wouldn't do it if if I knew that it was, you know, unsafe. And it isn't because this is the industry that, um, as I've said before and previously, that um, how they put aeroplanes uh, into service before it ever gets, you know, to flying passengers, what it goes through and the mm-hmm. relentless sort of testing of the aeroplanes before, you know, they, they get released to, to um, commercial service. So that's one thing. So, you, and again, you can Google all those and how they, they make aeroplanes and test them and try and break them deliberately. But going back to your question about how do we manage having seen lots of, you know, the air accident investigation programs, etc. Yeah. So the, the fortunate thing, I guess, is, um, as you know, in history, at any time there was an accident, they, they find the, the black box, mm. like data recorders, and they relentlessly... Uh, look for those and as you know probably the, the the longest one in I don't know if it was history but um that Air France when it took them three years to find it because they weren't going to give up because they didn't understand what would cause the accident etc so the the benefit that we have from that is no accident is ever repeated so it, if it is a situation where it requires extra training or understanding then that gets circulated to all the airlines by the air, air plane manufacturers so let me ask the 
the, we the, the question. Yeah, no, I've got, <laughs> I've got to ask this question because I know there'll be a nervous flyer listening to this going, yeah, but in the meantime, if they in didn't the meantime, know what happened, there was three years and those aircraft were all flying around. Isn't that then dangerous? Yeah, no, and, and that that's, uh, how can I sum that up, is because, so the one aeroplane that's involved in an accident, there's hundreds of those, even thousands of those around the internet. So there's nothing happening to those. So you do know at that point, if, if it's not an aeroplane fault, it's not a construction fault at that point, because there's thousands of other aeroplanes flying, you see what I mean, mm. is it, if that makes sense. So as we learn from, if there's no other faults, you know, because obviously everything is, you know, maintenance records are just like pilot records, you know, they are absolutely scrutinized and they have to be maintained at all costs because, you know, the authorities are always looking at those. So, you know, if nothing, nothing is being flagged up, then, then it won't. So unfortunately those rare accidents that have happened and if they are bizarre, then it's often, as we know, sadly, a very, long mm. chain of events that have caused um you know human error uh, to you know to occur on that day so going back to why do pilots then still go back to work the next day yeah is we know how these aeroplanes work you know they, they don't break you know aeroplanes don't just fall out of the sky and they don't break up in midair which i know for the people that are scared of flying that um, that doesn't sound <laughs> well, how do you know well, we, we do, and we know going through all our training what's involved. You know, we've said on our previous evening, you can't break the wings off. You know, they don't bend. They don't, you know, but, well, they do bend, they flex, but so they don't snap off, you know, because they're not glued on, et cetera, et cetera. But we know the theory of flight as well. And putting an aeroplane into the air, you know, air, you know, gives the, the wings lift. You know, mm. do we need engines? No, we don't. You know, we can glide, and et cetera, et cetera. So... So that's the first thing. We know that aeroplanes like to fly. They're built to fly. And secondly, all the training that we do, the relentless training before we get released onto the line is just scenario after scenario after scenario. And, you know, at critical stages of flight, and we get the most heinous, you know, severe scenarios thrown at us. And you have to pass those in order to, to have your uh, and, and, you're, and you're guilty of that because you're actually an examiner aren't you <laughs> <laughs> i do i put people <laughs> as well so uh, but not only that but i have to do it as well for every six months for, for myself so and i get things thrown at me but, so uh, that's an interesting was it because so you you're r- running like these training programs as a training captain mm. Uh, which I always have a bit unsure of the terminology there because it doesn't sound like it's, it's like a training captain sounds yeah, like, like, like I'm a, under tra- yeah like <laughs> I could you just started <laughs> yeah but a training <laughs> captain so look so you're putting together all these programs you're putting together these sim details and sort of thinking right we're going to take them through this and they're going to have to go through this pass or fail and then you you go into it does that do you get still get nervous at all no, I don't get nervous. So in, in many ways, you look forward to, you know, being challenged. That, that's the best way I can put it, because you, you want to um, succeed. So, you, you know, it, it's just something you're so used to. You're used to being put in under pressure. You know, sometimes it's time pressure. Sometimes it's, you know, a critical stage of flight that, you know, requires, you know, certain pressure pot building. So it's just a challenge but you know that you will come out the other side because you're mm. trained to do it and that's the that's the beauty you know that the scenarios that we we give that they're all because we're trained to certain levels you can survive them that, and that's that's exactly what testing of airplanes is all about before they get released the line is because they put them through the most heinous things that that can happen mm. and of course there's certain things that we don't produce and some of the horrible accidents you've seen on tv that you know they they were caused by something completely other than mother nature or a a failure of a system on an airplane so and and those things you know needless to say we we can't ever train for them there are certain things that have happened of late so what what sort what well i'm talking one in germany so you know those things if people are scared of flying you you can't you know that that's something you can't train for so that's Mm -hmm. like you know, we get in our cars every day and, and or walk along the street. And of course, those horrific things that have happened in the last few years where someone, you know, drives a lorry into a crowd of people. Well, you, you can't, there's no, 
amount of when you do your you know you learn to drive and stuff your driving test there's no amount of training or avoidance that you could ever envisage that that would ever happen so yeah if that so i'm talking about the control of an airplane so if we lose engines if they you know if engines go on five we lose hydraulics electrics etc really critical stage of flight we're trained to recover those because that's how the airplane is is built you know it has so much redundancy so it just gives you confidence in in, in your tools and and airplanes are as i said before are made way far better and stronger than any other like the automotive industry etc so let me ask another pain in the butt question then no, how, <laughs> how can you how can you stop yourself getting overconfident you don't because you, you can't allow egos to come into this job at all. And that would, believe me, that would be ironed out very, very quickly. And also, um, if you began your career with an ego as a youngster, you will make mistakes because your ego will get in the way. And that has happened. I've seen it over the time. You know, I've been lucky enough to, to sit where I do. And you do. You see someone slightly overconfident in it. And yeah. There's you, you deliver them a, a scenario, a pressure pot scenario with a fade in it, and all of a sudden it's, uh, they're eating humble pie because they realise that actually <laughs> you have to remain professional. And uh, yeah, this is all ironed out in the simulator and in the training, I'm guessing, by the sound of it. You know, it's just like I said before, on our previous course when we said, what do pilots do in order to get you know to an operational line? You know, it's uh, relentless, relentless mm. training that will be ironed out. Uh, and you can get people over the line. You know, it's very rare that people don't, you know, get over the line. So some people do, you know, it's uh, and the odd failure over the years, you know, but that, that's often due to something else rather than their ability. And you can train them through things that they, that they, they may find, you know, too challenging themselves. So it's, yeah, luckily we have the, what's gone before us you know I, I don't want to use the term guinea pigs but they are because you know that's that's just how a, aviation's evolved we, we're so lucky now to have such incredible redundancy in the way technology is has advanced that how reliable just engines alone 99.9999 percent you know reliable so there is no other industry that requires such a you know level of redundancy in that in that way what about so engine failure on takeoff I don't know, like flying over water at night, none of the nothing like this, all these normal sort of so you can't see bugger all like you look out the window. <laughs> well, I assume you can't see very much, but none of this worries you. No, absolutely not. No. Um we we're, we're trained, you know, we have a thing called instrument rating, so we don't actually need to see see outside. So we, we can fly solely by the use of instruments, which is which is very good. Well, obviously we need to see the runway that we're taking off on. And that's it, because there's no such thing as an automatic takeoff. But we have an automatic landing, you know, which we use in fog and stuff. So we actually don't ever need to see the runway that we're landing back on when, when the weather's like that. So that's just incredible. But you Can know. you imagine that one day there'll be a case where you'll have single pilot operation because they've got so much tech? They're talking about it. Yeah. It, I don't think personally, I don't think it's going to happen in, in our lifetime, but that's, that's just my own thought because... It is capable. I mean, the, the, you know, there's military jets flying without pilots at the minute, as, as we know. But would I think it would ever happen on a commercial aeroplane? I would have thought, um, although it is, it's probable and it's, and it's possible, but I'm not sure that the, <laughs> the paying public who want to know that they're <laughs> flying in a, in a tube with, with no one at the front, yeah. I, I can imagine. So. Yes, it does. I'm not sure I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and all that, I mean, it's, you know, they're talking about autonomous buses and cars and things like that. But, yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, I don't know. I think the infrastructure is not in place for, for anything like that yeah. right now. Maybe not in our lifetime then, Steve. Exactly, yeah, yeah. When they do levitation and hoverboards and that, well, <laughs> yeah. you know, talking about flying cars now, you know, which, again, are, are in existence. But who's going to fly them? You know, presumably only trained pilots would be allowed to fly them. You're not going to allow just because someone can afford these things, which I imagine they're going to be extremely mm. expensive. You're not just going to let anyone just no. you know jump into their James Bond car and off they go in Little Nelly, and that's not going to happen because safety is paramount. And you know that will be an extremely regulated sector if if that does happen. So. 
Yeah, because we think about how much training and regulations in place for you guys, you know, compared mm. to say driving a car, you take it, you do your car test, and oh, we always say this. I know it's apologies for repeating, but you know, you do your driving test at whatever age you do it, and that's it. Yes. There's no, there's no other retesting. There's no. Uh, at least with the motorbike license in the UK, you can only get to a certain CC and then you have to wait a couple of years and then you can go to the, the, like, it is a bit of a step to change, but right. you've got, yeah. you're in charge of a killing machine. Yes. Uh, and like a, you know, a half a ton of metal and yeah. that's it. One test. Yeah. And, and yet you're getting tested every six months on your ability yeah. to do it and getting all the worst case scenarios thrown at you. Yes. I yeah. suppose you're not a nervous wreck. <laughs> I think that's what it is. It keeps us on our toes, to be honest. And, and that's why you don't, you know, going back to what you just said, uh, why you don't get overconfident, because we know every six months that our, our licenses are on the line. You know, for two days, we're, we're going to be tested and that license needs to be signed again. So, yeah, we've spoken to before, like incredible industries, you know, like surgeons and, you know, and again, just a bit like that years ago that they, they passed, you know, uh, having done seven, eight years, incredible study, you know, but they don't get tested again. And that's, mm. that's an interesting thing because you think about how incredible their skills are and how much everyone in the world will rely on them, you know, if needed. And it's incredible. They're saving lives, which is just, you know, the fact that they're not being put through a simulator every six yeah. months yeah. is, is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So I know we're operating heavy machinery in that, but um, that's a proven fact that, uh, that these things do work and they don't just break and they don't fall out of the sky. And that's why training is just paramount. It's never, you know, things that we're doing now every six months weren't even in existence in, in training when I first started 32 years ago. You know, we, we've what discovered... Sort of, such so as... Well, the, the way we can fly procedures, you know, we, we've made them, you know, much safer. We've made the way we interact now in the flight deck and weird enough talking about the medical industry that they've actually adopted what we started uh, years ago the aviation industry you know when we started as crm cockpit resource management you now you know, human factors mm. but that's now spreading across other industries that require um, people to to behave <laughs> you know, to, to interact properly and uh, and there's so many behavioral trigger points now that um, you can recognize when you know, people aren't working together or, or, you know, or having problems as a team, et cetera. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's useful it's, stuff. So those who have, have want to research this, the human factors stuff is around human performance really, isn't it? And the airlines were fundamental. I think it was the eighties. It probably started. It did. It started doing the, the human factors. And what this is saying is that, you know, we are, we're fallible. We make mistakes, which is why mm. you always have, two pilots and and th little things you'll notice i've seen this when they and i've watched simulator training and i've like i love the way that you communicate with each other you know, like nobody touches anything before checking with the other person when they have done it they confirm it and it's yes. all that kind of verbal thing and the other thing i like is that thing about positive stress and unhelpful stress is that you, you know you, the place that you work i think they call it you stress where you're mm. able to be fully function you're very aware and alert but you're not mm. overloaded and it's recognized and what you try to do in the simulator is overload people to see what if they can still communicate because communicating and hearing goes doesn't it? it exactly that yeah and you're right we you're just a bit of a bastard really aren't you just <laughs> <a> sick man <laughs> we used to get mark you know for example we used to you know do a a scenario or a, a maneuver we have to do we have to do certain maneuvers you know as part of your life and you used to get marked out of, for example, one to five, you know, one was was good and two, three, four and five. And, you know, you'll you'll be doing extra training if you get. To five. But now we don't have there is no mark. You don't like O levels and A levels. Oh, no, let's show my age. Uh, what was it called now? Oh, it is A levels still. GCSE is A star or whatever. You know. We don't have those markings. We have nine competencies, nine pilot competencies, which are worldwide for, for every airline now. Mm. And it's an industry standard. And. And those competencies are, as you say, things like situational awareness, workload management, leadership, problem solving, etc. Mm. And you can absolutely identify using one of those competencies what someone is is uh, displaying well or needs functioning somewhat. Is it nine of them you said? Yes. Yeah. Is this an international it, thing? It, Everyone's it, using them. 
but it's very, very um, helpful psychology that's been introduced into, you know, to to recognise, as you say, we are humans at the end of the day because we have the most wonderful equipment, but we're human beings and we're operating this this equipment. And so we need to be aware of what our limitations are. And that's just incredible how that's evolved over over the years. I'm still sort of taken back to that because I think when I sat in the flight deck and obviously you've not just arrived and that's it, you're plonked in there. I look at all those fuses and oh my goodness, you know, you, and, and the days when I uh, worked briefly as cabin crew, we had, you had sort of flight engineers and so there's like a whole panel next to them. Mm-hmm. So two people managing all of that. It's just, a, oh, it looks so overwhelming. And then you've got all those people behind you that you're responsible for. So I wondered how do you get, you know, you said, right, you look out for number one, we'll bring you back to that point. How do, how do you sort of, how do you just stay calm and not sort of have that overload? I, I just, I'm really curious how you do that. Yeah, well, I, I, you don't know, do you? I, I don't, I, it, <laughs> it, it, it comes natural. And I suppose that's why people choose that, that profession, because you wouldn't be uh, wanting to, embark on that career if if that is something that did freak you out somewhat that you think is uh, if I speak to uh, any of my colleagues or maybe any pilots listening I don't suppose you would be being a scared yeah, of you listen to this yeah. but um, <clears throat> if you were I'm sure they'd all agree it's actually you don't think about it because you are you are literally you know as I as I said before because you're looking after number one if you like who's the most important <laughs> on the aeroplane and anyone listening going, well I am of course <laughs> you are in your own entirety <laughs> the fact that the pilots are looking after themselves and well the captain is the one that signs for the aeroplane and ultimately you know you look after number one it, it is your responsibility but it's not being a blase thing to say you don't think about it because it, it, it just doesn't come to the forefront of your mind because mm. you have so much to do and you know you're busy doing what you do and and that's it isn't crap I mean don't get me wrong you know I, I'm like anyone I can stop and watch an aeroplane take off and fly you know and just and and, and it's still amazing I, I don't think there's there's not a pilot in the world it just it still goes wow you know even though you understand the theory yeah. behind it, you yeah know, but when you see a, a 747 or a, the, the the A380 you know those huge aeroplanes of 500 tons you know when it lifts off the ground you just think now oh, that's impressive you know mm. because it is spectacle but we understand how that works and why it's possible and it, but it's still a joy you know to, to watch because it's a, a wonder of science isn't it so all I can say is when you're actually at the controls of one of those things you don't have time to to appreciate you know what it is because you are literally just it's you with your hands on these controls and you are looking after number one and that's you know you're, you're going safely from A to B and therefore everyone comes with but I hope that's not a too simplified way of saying it but it really is mm. um, so do you think there's a certain type of person that so you know a better question might be can anybody be a pilot or does it take certain personality types anybody can yeah you, you can be trained to the if they have obviously the ability to pass the the standards required but absolutely anyone could you know go into um, well anyone could go down a flying club and and take what they call a trial lesson and, and find out whether you have the aptitude to obviously. So what is certain... the aptitude? Is it a sort of, I've well, always it... wondered, is it a sort of certain way of what brain wiring? Is it like a kind of a, a hand thing, hand eye thing? Or what, what is yes, it? that's what we call it. So the hand eye foot coordination. So you'll, you'll know early on. I, I've spoken to, to people who've said, oh, I did a trial lesson once. And then they said, absolutely loved it, but just couldn't do it. I just, just could not tell my, my hands, my feet, and 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 my brain to, to work in one thing. So yeah, it's a bit an analogy is, is a drummer. So mm-hmm. you've ever had, you know, in fact, I either wanted to be a drummer or a pilot when I was <laughs> I was a kid. And if you have a go at doing the drama, it's it's amazing, you know, with your feet and your hands and your and the tempo and everything is is uh, is quite something to, to oh I, so because you're using all three faculties at, at that point, and you'll you'll soon know during the the aptitude testing of, of embarking on a pilot whether you actually have the ability to to control your hand eye foot coordination early on but if you do then then then, then that's trainable you know that's 
it's not for everyone. It's a bit like sports, isn't it? You know, not everyone is so, uh, you know, skillful to, to, to take sport to a certain level because you just don't have the, the coordination. So, so it's interesting. So there's, there sounds like there's not, some innate there's, stuff. Myself, not everybody can, but you, mm. you are certainly able to try and that, that's for sure. So. Yeah. So it sounds like there's some innate stuff, but also, yeah. Yeah, I suppose if you've done a lot of sports, played the drums, uh, maybe you'll have. You, you might have some aptitude. You might, you might yeah. be, you might have the aptitude and not know it, or you yeah. might have the desire and go along and realise actually it's not for me. I, I, yeah. I just can't do it. No, no exactly. Personality-wise, there is no trait of one personality. That there are absolutely there's just so many different personalities flying aeroplanes, and I think when we were all growing up or people watching films they often <laughs> portray pilots as um sort of the top guns and, and all that kind of you know they, they portray them as certain but they're not believe me that's that's just dramatizing so you're gonna burst a bubble there i think yeah i know, I know. Um, i'd like to say it looked like tom cruise but sadly it's <laughs> yeah. i'm taller than him anyway <laughs> well that's something isn't it yeah, okay. that's something you know oh if you're listening sorry but i think you're great anyway but we're not all that stereotypical you know Old Kazansky, old Val Kilmer, we're, we're, not, we're not like that with big shiny teeth. And that. So it's quite funny. When, and I have to say, when I first started at 21, I was quite surprised because I, I often thought, well, they're all going to be like, you know, those old war movies and John Wayne from the European and stuff like that. But incredibly, they're not because there are just so many different personalities. Incredible. They're all from different walks of life. You don't have to have done any, you know, astrophysics at university or anything like that. It's just whether you have the aptitude, the coordination and the ability to to operate under pressure. And, and, and it is an incredible melting point, melting pot of different personalities. But the one common denominator is they're all trained to the same standard. And that's, that's the bottom line. Yeah. So when you get on, so that's that's a good point actually. So they're all trained to the same standard. I've asked this before, but I just think it's quite yeah. so you you get go off on a jolly you're not flying virgin you're flying somebody else yes they land into the uk do you worry do you research them do you look at the weather or do you just what do you do when you're going to do a flight as a normal person no as a normal person <laughs> so everyone flying in and out of the uk or any major airport around the world that they're scrutinized by the authorities so each country won't allow any operator into your country they will only allow known operators that um, achieve certain standards and that's why you don't need to to um, contemplate whether one is better than the other and mm. you know a low cost or whether you know etc etc so so you um, don't worry then you get on the flight you don't think about it no no in fact i'm probably a it's a bit like a, a bus and holiday for me but i just <laughs> i'm not a good passenger as in as in get on with it can we get there <laughs> right do you ever but sit I, there thinking, oh, I don't think that landing was very good, or not? And I think this approach. Do you ever, do you sit there like, or do you just switch off completely? Completely switch off. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, you know, you just, just, just trust. I, I, I often look around and look at the reactions of people, then because um, you know, I, I as a passenger, you know, sometimes you know, whatever landing it is, and you look around and either people are clapping or or, <laughs> or shouting expletives across the cabin gate. <laughs> you know, a polite way of saying. That landing was unusual. <laughs> well, it was always, it's, it's when just the cabin crew used to wind up the pilots and say, "Yeah, Jesus, that was a hard landing." Was it? Well, we shot down, you know. To, 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 <laughs> but I, I can't imagine how difficult it must be to touch down when you're so far away from your from the wheels. I don't yeah. know how you do it. I mean, it's just no, phenomenal no. to you know to yeah. do those gentle kiss the runway. <laughs> yeah. How the hell do you do that? Yeah, and. As, as we've said before on previous courses, you know, actually a good landing is a very, is a is a firm landing, you know, which is people in in the in the back going, well, I'm not going to fly with that yeah. <laughs> back shower again because actually they're not. It's just knowledge is power, and and a good landing is a firm landing. So perhaps people listening now can actually go next time and and you think it's people think it's some horrendous sort of arrival into into a runway, you know, a controlled crash. It's not. So if it's firm, you might actually reverse your psychology. Go, oh, that was a good one. Then that's mm. what Steve said on the podcast. So, and we, don't get me wrong, we all, you know, as pilots, we we love to, you know, kiss the runway. You know, it's uh, and there's there's just certain circumstances that will allow you, you know, to do that. And 
a textbook landing is a firm landing. <laughs> well, that's good to know because yeah. I've seen in the in the Love Fly Facebook group that people have said, "Oh, I had a really firm." You know, it can be things that triggered them. You know, and mm. this misperception thing. So we took off, and then there was this massive deceleration. So we yes. talked about that before. The fact that yeah. Yeah. it's not it's just a sort of a quieting of the engines and yes the oh, noise actually, of- we had a really bad landing and that can be triggered so prefer- knowing that a firm land is a textbook land is really helpful for people what about during turbulence and just to sort of reiterate turbulence rubbish weather lightning you're in the aircraft you're flying it what what do you make of all of that if anything nothing we, we um it, it's just mother nature you know uh, I've been doing this for 32 years and, and I've been involved in all sorts of weather. That's just mother nature, but it doesn't stop you. What's, what's the, the, phrase? Um, the weather's not going to stop you going forwards, if you know what I mean, A to B. So we, we obviously plan routes, you know, and we have systems that we will avoid, you know, certain weather, but some weathers we have to fly through, but it, turbulence in in answer to your question is that's something that will never stop an aeroplane flying so we don't sort of hold off and go oh, we're not going to go any further we'll we'll just go around in circle we, we just we fly through it because we know it's not dangerous it's just uncomfortable it's an uncomfortable mm. experience for people mm. who who don't again a- appreciate what's actually happening to the aeroplane so you know the air hasn't disappeared over the wings the lift is still on the wings but the, the air is disturbed over the wings that's what this causes that ripple effects the cobblestone effect in your car etc but in answer to your question about what are we doing we're not even thinking about oh there's uh, we're, we're just we're just flying the airplane you know and we'll put the seatbelt signs on because it's uncomfortable so it's better that everybody sits down behind us so mm. I've said to you on previous courses as well, sometimes you get a call from the cabin go, can you put the seatbelts on? <laughs> oh, is it, is it bumpy down there? <laughs> because sometimes, you know, it, you, it, it's not an event, if you know what I mean. You know? Yeah. And, I, and that's talking about sort of light, the ripples, you know. And at the very front of the aeroplane, sometimes, you know, that's why first class is at the front. We've spoken about that before. Mm back of the aeroplane will feel it you know more so that's because well, we, uh, we, we recently did a one-to-one course together with uh, this particular individual who wanted some help we used a commercial simulator which steve yeah. flew and one of his things was about turbulence and so mm-hmm. i was quite surprised because we set it I mean, this the commercial simulators are just mad madly good aren't they it's just like when you're in there it's like an air it's an aircraft it doesn't feel any different yeah. but we set it to severe mm. because he was worried about just general turbulence and, and mm. it was amazing how what well, you actually get you once you know nothing's going to happen mm. and you mm. sit, watch the altimeter and nothing's changing particularly much but it moved no. a bit didn't it but it was no, over, exactly. over but a distance like a, like a waves of so sort of like going right. over ocean waves, wasn't it? So it's like moving like that. And uh, it was, I think it was really helpful, but it's very hard to visualise that when you're no, it, nervous, you know. It, exactly. And we demonstrate, as you, as you know, um, which again you do on your courses. I know we were at 37,000 feet and we we put on severe turns when I, and I explained to that gentleman that in 32 years, I've probably only had that five or six times, you know, that's what how rare it is. But when mm. we engaged severe turbulence in the simulator what we were getting him to do was look out whether you know the wings aren't rocking you know side to side they just as you say it's that porpoising effect so then i disconnected the autopilot and then i turned the airplane as if we were turning after takeoff or coming into land etc and i said you know this is what the airplane's not doing you know with 30 degrees of bank etc and i think that's what really helped him because he suddenly realized actually no it, it's not you are yeah. maintaining an equal level flight albeit porpoising you're not dropping out of the sky which is this you know the fear yeah. that I yeah have. and people feel like it is but there is a feeling rather than it is. reality isn't it and, and yeah and that's the bit about the inner hairs in your ear you know as a passenger because you can't see forwards etc is, is making it feel 10 times worse than it actually mm. is hence why you you asked originally about you know what are pilots doing in turbulence well because we can see out the window we we're not feeling what you're feeling you know we know you're feeling it but we don't feel it because yeah. we can we can see forward. So when I'm a passenger, I feel turbulence just like anyone else that might be listening. 
but I know what's happening. So, yeah. and because turbulence happens on every single flight, you know, I, I, I'm sure people wish, okay, how <laughs> we've been asked, haven't we, before, you know, how can I guarantee that this one flight, there's not going to be any turbulence? Is the answer is you can't. So, and it's, that's impossible. And I don't think there's ever any flight that I've ever been on from A to yeah. B that hasn't been I some. I think turbulence is a, a, a proof of the power of the air. When you think about it, because you, mm. when you're looking out the window and people have described it different ways, you know, Dom used to say it's there's custard. You're in a <laughs> yeah. bowl of custard and someone else describes it like you're in jelly. And so, yes. you, you know, the, the, air, the jelly will move, but the aircraft's intact. Yes. But when you're looking out, you just can't see anything, can you? So no. I think so. Turbulence actually proves there's power there, isn't there? There's that's is. that's what's holding the aircraft in the air, you know. And it's just yes. it's proof. It's just going in. There's a little yes. little reminder, but not so much so that it's a problem for us. Exactly. Yeah, the air's not going anywhere. It's it's always there. It's omnipresent. Hmm. That's a good word, isn't it? Setting very, very good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know what it means, but it sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, this it's been really helpful just to do this. So I was really curious about how you kind of do the mindset thing. And so that's helped with that. If you had to give your sort of like big top tip for those who are thinking about uh, and went, need to get over this fear of flying, what's your what's your main message or your, you know, the big, yeah, the big piece of advice? Well, I, I think one I've, I've always say on the on the call is um just if you can stop and think about the people that are at the front of the aeroplane and think about, are they human beings like, like yourself? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. So the men and women that sit at the front of aeroplanes now, they have lives and most of them will have families, whether they have their own children, but they will be part of a family and they're not going to jeopardize that. This, this is their career. It's not some big uh, experiment that's going on for this particular day that they're trying to get you uh, onto your holidays. That's not, <laughs> that's not the case. The people at the front of the airplane have lives and they've chosen a career that's without doubt the most safest form of transport in the world, Barnum. And we've done all those statistics before in, in, in my, you know, on courses where it's, it's far more dangerous to drive a car or walk across the road etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. so if you can just stop and think about the people that are at the front of the airplane they are just like you they eat as well do they, they eat and drink <laughs> they do they breathe the it's same they, do. they have to get up in the morning and they have to uh, deal with all sorts of things in in life just normal weather. but the work they do and i know it is different and people but it's not an experiment and they are the most highly trained professionals that have been through an enormous amount of, you know, and it goes back to the thing, when, when you first come into an aeroplane flight, it, it is, it's daunting because you see all these hundreds and hundreds of instruments, but because they've been through it for so long and repetitive, repetitive, it, it, it's their office, you know, that they know how that's working, in it, but mm. it, it is, it's daunting. So if you stop and think about it, it's taken them years to get to that point with taking you on holiday. And the good thing is when they take you to your destination and they want to go home at the same time and they're not going to jeopardize that so they, they just wouldn't and so if you think about the knowledge they have and they're doing it because they understand it and they know that these machines work that's my top tip awesome awesome captain steve excellent thank you so much <laughs> and, and lovely to Again, see you i hope i'm not I hope i'm not it's, it's you know i'm not not simplifying it but it really is that simply if you, you just if you can just bring yourself back to the level of actually just understanding mm -hmm. that that they're human beings doing this and and they're not the people you see in hollywood movies <laughs> no and we're not going into war we're not going into any combat <laughs> just... so would you get so on that note then uh, you get on board the aircraft and uh, you, the pa comes over and says good morning ladies and gentlemen sir uh, captain john travolta would you just on that flight? Well, the problem with that is all the women would then run to the front and try and get into the cockpit, I'm sure, at that point. So, or maybe not. Yeah, maybe not, you know. Maybe yeah. men and women, I think. <laughs> yeah, you know, go and roll out. Luckily, he's got the uh, bulletproof Kevlar door uh, to, to keep them out. But uh, 
So when it's, I see, so because he's an example of somebody that's done lots of pilot training, and isn't I, he? And I think he is I, trained. I think I, not only that, and I hope you, I think it's fantastic. I love listening to him. he. Um, his home, I, I, I think it's in Florida. I'm not sure, but um, he actually has a runway, and his his garage is is a ter- <laughs> is a terminal building, isn't it? It's a jetty. And he flies a, it's a 707, I think it's an, an original, it's a Qantas, I can't remember, but, um, and he wears his uniform and he looks a bit, <laughs> how cool is that? Pull up to your aerop- um, your house in your airplane, not park in your car, your Ford yes. Sierra. Just, <laughs> I'll just I'll just switch off the 707. To, might be a bit noisy if he leaves early in the morning, I guess, for the, the other family members, you know, if he's firing mm. up a 707. But, mm. but yes, no, there are people like that. And, and that's right. And it's great. You know, he's, he's utilised his money in a, in a very different way to, to but incredible but he he's not flying those aeroplanes by the way because he's john travolta uh, and a flying school just went oh my goodness john travolta's here you know here's a license he also had to go through every single training course that that we do so he he's no different and he has to maintain his knowledge and he will have to um, be tested every six months just like any other pilot and it's not because he's a it's a famous uh, hollywood actor so yeah mm, thank you Cool guy. Captain Steve, thank you very much, sir. And uh, oh, it's a so we obviously we're working together on the uh, live webinar at the end of June, depending on when this goes out. Yeah. And uh, we're going to be running those more. We've run quite a few over the last few years, haven't we? And Steve's on the 30 day program and also uh, pops up some of it. My answers in the Facebook group are often words that I've taken from Steve's mouth. Because I, if I get piloty questions, there are quite a few pilots that, are like your mate Pete Leg and Dave Mabbit, they're in the group as well, and they sometimes answer. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Steve, for all you do, and uh, thank you for your time today. As well. Absolute pleasure, and uh, to anyone listening, you know, just good luck with you know pursuing your endeavour to uh, cure yourself of, of you know anything that makes you fear flying, but you know stick at it because it's there to be enjoyed. Thank you.